another few seconds, very, very few seconds. Yes. Okay, please, Sauron. All right. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, I'm on air. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks for, uh, uh, for giving me the chance to open, actually, this conference after uh, Stefano, who was once upon a time, actually, one, uh, uh, in fact, I was his mentor, but now I have to be very careful because he's much above me since he's the his boss of the entire uh, uh, University of Tusha, so I should treat him with a lot of deference, actually. Yes, so, you better uh, anyway, behave. <laughs> I better behave, indeed. So, uh, no, I'm serious, I'm really very, I feel kind of old, but happy somehow because it's a long and winding road, as, I, as you can read probably from my first slide, which dates back, goes back 34 years, which is a lot, actually. And 34 years ago, we were almost all 34 years younger. I say almost because I guessed some uh, of you in the audience were not yet born in 1986. Don't know whether you can see my pointer. This is Los Alamos, and this is Gary Doolin, uh, 34 years ago. And this long and winding road goes now, uh, takes us where we are today in Viterbo. And in the process, it has been going around pretty much around the globe. Uh, I, this is just a number of places which I could reconstruct by heart. Uh, a lot of uh, North America, uh, Brazil, a lot of Asia, China, and India. And of course, a lot of Europe, including Rome, as Luca was uh, reminding us uh, a few minutes ago. Um, so, uh, I apologize, this will be personal, this will be a personal recollection for, uh, since I had the good fortune to be around uh, basically from day one, so I apologize uh, to the other important methods which make part of the SFD, which is not only about Lattice Boltzmann, uh, but I will tell you the Lattice Boltzmann story just because I happen to, uh, again, to, to, to have the chance to watch this story unwinding in, in time up to today. Um, so I divided the story in four, five acts. Act number one is the Jurassic. Jurassic means 1986 to 90, and these were in fact the days uh, which I would say made, uh, an imp I mean, change actually the course of my scientific career, by the way. And I think uh, we should not forget, actually, that uh, uh, our field owes a lot to the famous lattice gas cellular automata. We are precisely dating in 1986. Uriel Frisch, top left, Bross Aslacher, Yves Pomo, which, by the way, had important precedence 10 years before, the famous HPP, which predated uh, the lattice gas. And I would say for the record, Stephen Wolfram, which is Wolfram, the mathematical Wolfram, which uh, uh, claims credits in the story, and I think rightly so. Be as it may, uh, these people basically uh, found a quantitative uh, way to simulate fluid flows using Boolean rules, actually, Boolean fluids. Boolean means that it's an amletic fluid, fluid, to be or not to be, either you have a particle moving along one of these six direction here, or you don't, which means that each direction is coded by a bit, bit off no particle, bit off one particle moving along one of the six directions. When you let this uh, rule, Boolean game, uh, run for long enough, and you run enough of these automata, what you see actually is fluid patterns, like the one uh, represented here on the, on the uh, bottom right, and of course, if you are a fluid engineer, you are not really very impressed about that. But people, including actually Richard Feynman himself, were very excited because the usual story, I mean, not the usual, the story was complex behavior, emergent complexity out of simple uh, elementary microscopic rules. So the principle was there and people got very excited. Excited to the point that, uh, believe it or not, there was a paper in, a, in an article in the Washington Post saying that the discovery was so relevant that probably should be kept out of the Soviet hands. And don't forget that the Berlin Wall was still standing in 1986, three years to go before uh, the, the Berlin Wall was down. So people took this very, very seriously, and at the closer inspection, of course, the smart people realized that there were problems you know, in the way, and a number of problems, both conceptual and practical. And uh, the first Lattice Boltzmann was just born in the wake of one of these problems, which is statistical noise. 
automata means zero one, and of course zero one is you have to construct the uh, smooth signal for hydrodynamics, and it takes a lot of automata. So the noise was a serious problem. It would impair the efficiency of the scheme. And uh, this was quickly picked up by Gianluigi Zanetti and Guy McNamara. And uh, I'm, unfortunately, Gianluigi just passed away about a year ago in, in, a, in a plane accident. And I think we should really honor his uh, memory uh, and dedicate this issue of the, of the SD to, to his memory. Anyway, so what they did was just rewrite the same Boolean game, but for the both distribution f which is any number if you wish between 0 and 1 and these got rid of the noise problem but all the other problems in particular the fact the collision rule is uh, exponentially complex and if you're going through in 3d in these days 3d meant 24 possible direction and the complexity was 2 to power 24 which is uh, which was which is basically like performing 16 million operation every grid point every lattice side and again, nothing that would impress the professional people, uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics engineer. And then came what I regarded the lucky strike in my scientific life, because in summer 88, I was just back from Lausanne, now uh, from my PhD in plasma physics, by the way. And uh, Francisco Guerra came from Madrid, came uh, and visit me. Uh, and uh, Imanis, Javier Jimenez, who is a very well-known uh, fluid dynamicist, uh, organized a visit. And they came with very good news. Uh, the good news was the lattice Boltzmann uh, that Danette and McNamara had proposed, but the collision operator was actually simplified in the form of uh, actually a scattering matrix, if you wish, acting upon the departure of the distribution function from the local equilibrium. The good news is that both the local equilibrium and the scattering matrix could be pre-computed once and for all out of the lattice gas rules. Uh, the result was dramatic because instead of having exp an exponentially complex collision operator, sorry, what you have is in fact a quadratic operator because it's a matrix vector product. And as when you take into account the symmetries, it was almost linear, a little bit more than linear. So the exponential complexity was gone. And this was a major, major breakthrough. It's kind of amazing. Look at the pictures here. These are kind of historical. That's what the Guerra came to uh, in, in Rome in, in 88. And even those days, I must say that the quality of the graphics could have been better, right? Be as it may, these were the two papers which we published just a month later in a meeting in Turin, which was 1988, where people were still very keen on lattice gas. And we just showed up with lattice balsam. And I remember people got really very, very interested and said, what is this? And then uh, I was again in IBM and Roberto Benz was my boss at IBM and we discussed with the Aguera for a second visit. And I must credit Roberto came with the idea and said, guys, why do you want to construct the collision matrix or the scattering matrix out of the lattice gas rule? If in the end, what we need is Navier-Stokes, maybe we can just design the collision of uh, the, the uh, scattering matrix. Here I write it in spectral form. In other words, you can choose it based on, on just a, a property, which is the fluid viscosity. The fluid viscosity maps into the eigenvalue of the matrix, and you can construct the matrix. This marks the beginning of the so-called top-down formulation, where instead of deriving uh, the lattice boson from the lattice gas rule from the microscopic theory, you just design it top-down, starting from the macroscopic target, which was uh, Navier-Stokes. And that marks the beginning of lattice Boltzmann as a standalone and as a actually respectable method in fluid dynamics, uh, in computation fluid dynamics period. The limitations at that point were only due to the discreteness, uh, I mean, how many grid points you can put in your simulation, but had nothing to do with the underlying lattice gas uh, scheme. So at that point, this was to me, the end of the Jurassic and the beginning of Act Two, which you can locate more or less between 1990 and 2000. And Act Two is that Paris kicks back in. Why back? Because this is the Pierre Lalma, uh, Dominique Dumier, and Johan Kian. They are the authors of the famous uh, APL 1992, I think is one of the most cited papers in the field, justly so, because they did what we should have done, <laughs> but they did it. 
they realized that since we're only interested in basing in those days in Reynolds numbers, why keep in a full matrix? You can diagram, just choose a single time relaxation, which by the way was well known in kinetic theory since 1954. It's called Barnagar, Gross and Crook, BGK. And more than that, they gave actually a systematic way of deriving the local equilibria. Uh, once you decide the lattice, they, they gave a prescription. And before that, the lattice equilibria were built by basically um, matching, complicated algebraic matching. So this was a major breakthrough. And everybody started to use, in fact, the single relaxation time to the point that as I read the papers, uh, as I referee papers, which I basically don't do anymore, but many people, I, I see that they assume that this was the first lap. The lattice boson was born in BGK form, but no, actually it was born in, in matrix form just a few years before. And then, of course, another major development was the Hermit connection, namely people, especially the applied mathematicians, if you realize that there must be a way of deriving uh, the lattice Boltzmann out of the continuum Boltzmann by doing what a proper mathematician would do, namely uh, expand inner mid polynomials or whatever basis, and perform the integration which defines the hydrodynamic quantity, integration in velocity space, using quadrature, Gauss and mid quadrature, and that takes you to lattice Boltzmann. With two little caveats, though, personal caveats. First of all, it is not true that lattice boson is a subset of Hermit. There are uh, actually some lattice boson schemes which were actually proposed before the Hermit was found, which cannot be derived from Hermit because uh, I would, well, uh, Hermit somehow it's an overkill sometimes, uh, but I don't want to go into any detail. And the second caveat is that um, the Hermit formulation, of course, um, uh, emphasized the fact that you can, in fact, go back to the matrix formulation and tune the relaxation to equilibrium for different moments independently. It's called multi-time relaxation. And multi-time relaxation is, in fact, more general than single-time relaxation. And a part of the community took this very, very seriously, I would say even a bit too aggressively, claiming that single time is basically unstable, uh, very poor, and multi-relaxation time fixes all the problems. It's again a personal view, it is not like that. It's not necessarily true that multi-time relaxation is necessarily better than single time. So just to um, two caveats, because I found these statements uh, very often in the literature, uh, probably by people who don't know the full story, I mean, the, the, fully, the full beginning. The major, another major uh, post-Jurassic achievement is the entropic Gladys Boltzmann. And again, I've been very, very, I, very, actually, I'm very grateful to Rome, actually, because Carlin, Ilya, came and visited me to Rome again from, he was still in Russia in those days. And he spent a couple of years in, in Rome. I was at CNR at the time, and, and Ilya was the expert of an, an entropy, and it took him very little time to realize that uh, the lattice Boltzmann could be equipped with the uh, H-theorem. And I must tell you very honestly that when we ran the first lattice Boltzmann back in 1988, 89, we didn't know why the lattice Boltzmann was able to go to the low viscosity that we could achieve. It, it was a fact, but we didn't have a clue, frankly speaking. And I think the, the entropic uh, uh, work showed that indeed the top-down approach has a solid foundation. There is an ACE theorem, there is, if you wish, compliance with the second principle, and that is a major conceptual uh, breakthrough, not to mention the fact that Ilya developed much more sophisticated uh, schemes over the years till these days, and not coincidentally, I guess he got not one but two ERCs, and uh, I think, uh, again, I take responsibi responsibility for what I'm saying. I think the Entropic is the best lattice Boltzmann in town for very low viscous regime. And if you look into Ilya's paper, I mean, this kind of uh, results is something inimaginable unless you really have a scheme which can go very low in this, in this case. There is also a picture of Bruce because Bruce also did significant work in the, in the, in the field. And that's the right. That's the hydrodynamics. So we started from the conceptually exciting but not very practical uh, lattice gas flows in the 86. Shortly later we could produce decent hydrodynamics but 20 years or more actually down the line 
people can now design airplanes, real airplanes. This EXA, which was a company where this was developed, is now part of that so uh, company. And this is the kind of complexity that the lattice Boltzmann algorithm can now handle. So it's a major ride. And I cannot help but Steve Horsa, who unfortunately passed away 10 years ago, because Steve was absolutely instrumental in uh, making this chain possible altogether, especially the step from, you know, the figure in the middle to the real computation fluid dynamics in complex geometries. Steve was a big supporter of Aladdis Bolson. He made major contribution and he was a dear friend, still very much missed. So that could be the end of my talk. If after all, Lattice Bolson was meant to uh, uh, simulate fluid flows and turbulence, that's it. And some people, um, a number of people in our community thought that that was basically it. All you have to do is to make Lattice Bolson better and better from the point of view of uh, stability and numerics, period. Some other people, including myself, ask the different question is, can you go beyond fluids? Can, I mean, I try to put it lyrical. Is there lattice bolts on life beyond Navier-Stokes? And uh, I must say the comment was no, never. The, going beyond Navier-Stokes, there is no syntactics, there is no chapman Anscombe. you are doing uncontrolled stuff. Maybe true, maybe not. We do uncontrolled stuff. And I think, again, this is perhaps too bold a statement, but I think we are nearing what I would call a paradigm for flowing matter from, from equilibrium, which doesn't necessarily mean Navier-Stokes. And if I take a look at the number of applications, and these are just my own, so there is much, much more around, uh, applications go basically across all scale. And I'm particularly proud of mentioning the one the top uh, uh, left here, which is a relativistic jet. The paper was posted last Saturday. And Daniele Simeone is going to talk about that. Uh, this is a really an astrophysical application. So we go from the megaparsec down inside the proton, uh, namely the quark gluon plasma, covering basically every scale in between. I now take a step back. This is not the merit of Lattice Bolson. This is the merit of hydrodynamics, which is really the science of universality. Univer hydrodynamics basically embraces every possible scale, if you wish, under certain conditions. And Lattice Boltzmann is just good at taking full advantage of this universality. So I think by now, and if you look into the papers presented in this conference, the mainstream, there are two mainstreams in Lattice Boltzmann. I think that's where Lattice Boltzmann is here to stay. Complex fluid soft matter, multi-phase, multi-component, micro and nano, forms, uh, emulsions, you mentioned it. And here, of course, uh, how could I possibly forget the major pillar, which is the Shan Chen uh, paper, 1993. And there are other papers along this line, of course, Julia Yeoman's group also is responsible for major um, uh, development in this direction. This is a beautiful paper, really, I love it. Uh, too bad that they had the idea, not me, but I love it non nonetheless. It's a very smart way of introducing, if you wish, potential energy into the game, which immediately takes you to non-ideal fluids, but non-ideal fluids strongly out of equilibrium, okay? That's the major point. So you could retain all the good aspects of Lattice Boltzmann and still open up an entire new world of complexity. And when I give this to my students, I, in order to make a really big splash, I say, you can do that in a few tense lines of code, which is literally true. Uh, that would be another talk. But I mean, the simplicity of this add-on from the, from the modeling point of view and in terms of what you gain in terms of complexity in what you simulate is just outstanding. And in the later years here, there are a few people I, I'm most familiar with. Giacomo is standing there, Lucas. Federico is not in this conference, Mauro I think is. Uh, this is just the Italian connection. There is of course much more of uh, Paolo Filippi, Chauvin himself. And I apologize for those I forgot, but I mean, as I told you, this is a personal reconstruction. It turns out that if you are willing to use a, a more complicated uh, IR connectivity in the velocity space, you can go beyond the limitation of Shan Chen, which Shen Chen is fantastic, but of course it comes with a number of practical limitations. You can lift most of these limitations and that really takes you in the um, strongly non-equilibrium microfluidics, 
And I benefit in a lot of this, in my own ERC, is basically about uh, what I call microsolidics, because how to design material out of droplets. And here we are using, I would say, the best in class uh, uh, lattice boson schemes, which are actually augmented with other interaction. And Andrea Montessori, who is also in the conference, is responsible for a very beautiful uh, method uh, where we actually prevent the coalescence of these droplets, which is uh, very, very, uh, actually, it, it took a lot of effort to achieve the movie that you're watching right now. The second pillar, and again, this is reflected in our conference, is today, uh, is the fluctuating lattice boson, how to go to bring nanofluids into the, uh, in, in, into the realm of lattice boson capability. Here I would have a personal anecdote. I'm probably uh, going a little bit beyond time, uh, but I cannot help. Tony Ladd, uh, was kind enough to call me, uh, I was again still in IBM and said, Sauro, what do you think of using fluctuation on lattice Boltzmann just to mimic nanoflows? And they said, Tony, we just made a lot of effort to get rid of noise. Why do you want to put it back? And this proves how silly I was because Tony justly had a very good idea. And this actually uh, became a major mainstream still today. He has method, he, he, he published two basic papers in 1993, and of course there is, again, much more work, technical work on top of this, but the idea was there, how to move basically rigid objects into a lattice bolt or nanofluid in compliance with the fluctuation dissipation theory. And other people, Burkhard, Alex himself, Dan Frankel, they now have extended this into something which in my opinion, one of the major mainstream of lattice bolts, namely biological bodies, floating in a fluid. And here are just a few faces of the people I've been working with. I have the privilege of I've been working with and some other, some other friend, Tim, uh, Bastien, uh, known faces for the people for the, the SFD community. Uh, and here is where Lattice Boltzmann actually makes uh, full, uh, actually caches fully on the uh, capability towards parallel computing. Uh, we can now run, there are simulation around, and Jacom has one of them, I think it will show them, which uh, can run up to 100 billion uh, grid points. And I think there is really a bright future for computational biology and maybe even medicine. Peter Coven is pushing very hard in this direction. And again, I think this will be a very technological but very important application of lattice Boltzmann for the years to come. I hope there will be breakthrough over there, frankly speaking. And finally, uh, this, was, this was just a pure fluctuation. I tend to be rather curious. And at some point I thought, well, that to me, it seemed to me that kinetic theory is naturally covariant. So should have been uh, easier, relatively easy to apply to uh, relativistic flows. But of course I was wrong. And uh, it, it turned out that the relativistic Boltzmann equation, uh, the collision, uh, the local equilibrium is more complicated than Maxwell Boltzmann. It's called Maxwell and Neutner. And I got stuck until I visited Zurich and Miller and Hans Hermann. Particularly Miller found a way of code the lattice Boltzmann into um, la lattice Boltzmann for relativistic flu fluids. And I don't know whether this will become a major mainstream like complex flows, but I'm very happy that this year in Viterbo we have a special session and I'm very grateful to the speaker, who, Luciano Rassola and Wojciech Forkowski, which uh, will uh, be uh, delivering talks in, in this direction. And of course, I have to uh, thank uh, my friends, Italian friends, Alessandro Gabbana and Lele Tripiccioni in Ferrara, which took this relativistic lattice balsam much further. And just very recently, we have a paper where, uh, in fact, we start to look into the uh, uh, femtohydrodynamics, so the, the fluid dynamics inside the proton, the quark bluon plasmas. And as I was mentioning before, the same kind of scheme on a totally different scale, and Daniel, I think, will present that, has been uh, recently, just last month, basically, applied to the relativistic jets in, in astrophysics, which is a very, very fascinating story, but that's a talk in himself. So I don't know how I'm doing with time, but let me finish by with the act five is where do we go for the future, say 2020 on, and this is just a sparse list of items which came to my mind. I'm sure uh, you can enrich or change it as, as you best like it. I would say that there will always be enhanced needs for enhanced stability in low viscous regime. This is an evergreen subject. We will always need better and more uh, stable scheme as we go lower and lower in viscosity. 
I think there would be beautiful work, theoretical and computational work in developing a kinetic model, turbulence model based on kinetic theory instead of Nadia Stokes. There will be a lot of need for improved scheme where lattice Boltzmann is coupled to say uh, boundary element methods and fluid structure problems going across scales. This is a major item. It's a very difficult one, very technical, but I think that's uh, a very important area for, for future development. I would be very curious to see what happens when you put the fluctuating lattice Boltzmann on a high order lattice. I would expect that we can bring nanoflows into the strong non-equilibrium territory, which we can't for the moment because the scheme is crashing. We don't have enough stability. There is certainly a need for very robust and efficient Vlasov, Vlasov Poisson solver for biological and electrostatics in the complex geometries that we have in biology, for instance. And going back to the other extreme, namely the astrophysics, there is certainly a need for formulating lattice Boltzmann for uh, general relativistic, just to describe the, these jets I was mentioned before in the vicinity of black holes or neutron stars. And of course, there is a lot of work in the performance computing part because it is guaranteed that if we want to take our application into exascale computers, there will be new programming paradigms to be developed. Uh, I mean, that will be again a talk on its own. It's a very fascinating topic. So now to make Lattice Boltzmann suitable for an exascale machine, and it has to do mainly on the way you access memory, on the way you make the algorithm fault tolerant, it's really a gold mine for the computer scientists. And somehow, I would say, and I think Luca will be presenting something in this direction, everybody's talking about machine learning, maybe even too much, but machine learning is interesting. And I would just wonder how, whether, for instance, machine learning could actually, uh, whether we can learn, we could teach the machine to, uh, to learn new lattice Boltzmann schemes better than the ones we have. Just, it's just a possibility. This is just to say, I, I think you are, uh, you are, I'm, you don't see the very last line of my slide, but that says up for grabs for 2020 plus. And I think there is, of course, much more. So the subject is mature in a way, but still a lot of direction to go. Thanks time, this will be too long. So the first thank is of course to Ludwig, because as I'm saying, he did it all in the end. I mean, we somehow, our community, rewrote the Boltzmann equation in interesting ways, but as I used to say as a joke, no Boltzmann, no lattice Boltzmann. So thanks to Ludwig in the first place. And of course, and yet I could even get emotional to all my wonderful friends and colleagues, I would say colleagues, which ultimately became friends all around the world. And I must tell you that in these COVID days, one of the things which I'm missing most is the possibility to you know, travel around and meet people in person. That has been a fantastic experience. And the SFD had, of course, a major part in my life. So I'm really grateful to all of my colleagues and friends around the world, many of which I hope are uh, tuned here for Viterbo today. And of course, as Stefano was saying, uh, thanks to the organizing committee, I have to spend a single word here saying that when the COVID was actually showing his ugly face in early spring, uh, nothing could have been easier than saying, look, let's do it next year. And it was Stefan who said, look, guys, we can organize it online. And I, in the beginning, I, I was in the mood of saying, let's do it next year. But I think that was an excellent idea because I think it's a way of not surrendering to the coronavirus. Of course, we have to be careful. We, have to be, we don't, don't have to be reckless. But I think it's good to fight back uh, this COVID-19 as, as best as we can. Having said this, I really hope you will enjoy this the SFD 2020 and that will give a stimulus for many other beautiful editions to come, hopefully uh, in person, not, uh, not uh, uh, virtual, but enjoy the virtual nonetheless. So thank you very much. And I want to finish just, I have the privilege of introducing Giovanni, Professor Giovanni Galavotti, which is, uh, I mean, every Italian scientist should be proud of having Giovanni not only Italian born, I care a lot, but Italian, Giovanni spent his career in Italy. I mean, and I think that really <laughs> makes a difference. And uh, Giovanni is, uh, I mean, there is no point of introducing him, he's uh, one of the high, highest uh, beacons in, in statistical physics, in mathematical physics. And let me just mention two very minor things, like the Boltzmann Medal, right? And the Poincare Prize, uh, which I think speak alone for the uh, importance uh, and for the 
top level that uh, Giovanni has achieved to the benefit of, I would say, uh, the country and all the students and all the colleagues. So thank you, Giovanni, for uh, accepting this invitation. And with that, the, uh, I will stop it here and I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sauron. Uh, please just give me one moment to stop the recording and uh, to start uh